Welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure to be facilitating this session today on the Joint and Intersectoral Analysis Framework, or JIF, version 2.0, Updated Methods, Tools, and Processes for Humanitarian Needs Analysis. I know we have a lot of people who have registered for this event, and I do hope that it will be an interesting one, given that we've all seen JIF 1.0, and after a couple of years of testing and trying it out. We're now at version 2.0. So hopefully we'll hear more about it. For sure we will. It will be of use to all of you working in various contexts. And I see we have people joining us from all over the globe. So great to have you all with us. Just a little bit of background. The JIF version 2.0 is going to be setting the global standard for the estimation and analysis of humanitarian needs and protection risks. It's really supposed to help inform strategic decision-making, response analysis, and response planning through what is supposed to be a rigorous, evidence-based, and comprehensive joint and intersectoral analysis framework. The second version of the JIF has been developed by a partnership with some of the largest donors, UN agencies, global clusters, and specialized agencies under the framework of the Grand Bargain, and it will be rolled out for the first time this year with the humanitarian program cycle for 2024. And as I mentioned before, it does build on the learning from the first JIF and the two-year process of consultations, redesign, testing, learning, which also included academic and applied research. So the JIF will be able to provide some foundational information for the humanitarian needs overview that's part of the humanitarian response plans and that we do globally on an annual basis. And through its application, humanitarian actors are going to be able to better estimate the magnitude and severity of humanitarian needs, as well as build a better narrative about the drivers, linkages, and overlap of some of the sectoral needs and who are the most affected. And JIF is 2.0 is people-centered, and it's interesting because I just came from a consultation about the core humanitarian standard, which is also people-centered, and the revision around that. So there's a lot of revisions going around, so it might be interesting to see how they'll all be able to link together. But the JIF 2.0 is based on an analytical approach that considers the coexistence and intersection of different needs and how those combine to, and how their combined effects, sorry, lead to humanitarian outcomes. Um, I won't go into too much more detail, but just to say generally why the 2.0 of the JIF was needed is that this need for analysis in the system so that we can better understand needs in a way that's well measured and more people centered can help to foster a more coordinated approach when we're responding among different actors. So hopefully the new JIF 2.0 will contribute to reducing inefficiencies across the system and really contribute to more coordinated and strategic humanitarian responses that effectively address people's needs. With that, um, I am going to introduce our speakers who are going to walk us through a number of things. At the end of each of the presentations, we'll have time for some clarification questions. So I'll be looking out in the chat and the Q&A in case there's any clarification clarification questions so we can ask our presenters and then we should have some time at the end for more general questions and answers as well. So we have four speakers today joining us. We have Nick Hahn, who is a JIF Senior Technical Advisor, Alex Lasso-Ratz, who is Capacity Development Specialist in the GF, JIF Project Management Unit, Herbert Tatham, who is Humanitarian Affairs Officer in OCHA's Needs Analysis and Response Section, and OCHA's representative in the JIF Methodology Working Group. And last but not least, we have Christina Mayorano, who is Program and Policy Officer with the Global Food Security Cluster and the Global Food Security Cluster representative in the JIF Methodology Working Group. So welcome to all four of you. Thank you very much for taking the time to explain the JIF to us. I'm going to turn to you first, Nick, to tell us a few words on why there's now this new version of JIF, uh, much, in much better ways than I did just in the introduction. Um, and, and as a senior advisor, Nick has been providing overall technical leadership and was also part of the piloting of the comprehensive methodology in Somalia, which will inform the global rollout later this year. So Nick, can I turn to you, please? Sure, Manisha. Hello, everyone. And Manisha did a great job giving an overview of GIF. So 
Uh, I don't have any hardly anything else to add, except I'm going to drill down a little bit. Uh, so 20, 2023, uh, I think the numbers, Herbert will correct me, but I think we're looking at over $50 billion in humanitarian appeals and over 300 million people that are deemed as in need. So the big question is, what are the methodologies that arrive at those numbers? And more importantly, are those methodologies that are being used truly doing service to a people-centered based approach to make sure that scarce humanitarian resources get to the people in need the most? And not just money, but the allocation and the proportion of resources designed to meet their needs according to whatever deprivations they're experiencing. So that's the big question on the table. And my colleagues are going to go through some details about more specific questions that we answer. But I want to drill down on one aspect that Manisha mentioned. And that is GF 2.0 very deliberately is trying to bring together the uh, various sectoral or cluster perspectives on humanitarian needs and simultaneously do justice to the complexity of each one of those because each one of those needs and deprivations are their own phenomenon and their own way of understanding, their own conceptual model, their own methods, et cetera. And GF 2.0 is trying, has, has developed a methodology that brings those together while respecting that complexity, but also trying to have a, a methodology which is simple and can be applied consistently in the field. And my colleagues are gonna present the overall approach that we have. And in particular, there's a number of innovations I would even dare say breakthrough innovations for humanitarian analysis, that if these actually work and if they succeed and stick in our field, it's going to put us clearly on a trajectory to have a more needs-based, accountable, replicable, transparent way of, of defining humanitarian needs. So this is truly an exciting development. Uh, as was mentioned, this is over a number of years with a number of different uh, organizations, I think something like 26 different organizations have been involved. And we're just getting started because now the attention is going to be focusing on country engagement, country uh, planning, country training, and, and the like. So you're catching it at, at a really good time. This is the beginning of rolling out GF 2.0, and my colleagues are going to go to you. So thank you, everyone. Manisha, back to you. Thanks so much, Nick. And it does sound like it's the beginning of what can be a potentially game-changing way in which we're really looking at identifying the needs so that we can be much more accountable, because that has been one of the things in our sector that has always been so challenging in terms of how are we really identifying and quantifying needs. So I think not only for those who are practitioners, but also for donors, it potentially can really help in terms of where we prioritize needs. Um, I don't see any clarifying questions for you, so that makes it easy for you, Nick. Um, I'm going to turn over to you, Herbert, please, for a bit of a presentation on the background of the GIF and what the GIF 2.0 is. Sure. Herbert, thanks, Manisha, and, and thanks for setting the scene, both to you and to Nick. Um, my name is Herbert Tatham. I work in the needs and response analysis section here in Geneva, sort of at the center of a lot of uh, discussions globally around normative frameworks and approaches to coordinated assessments. Uh, so let's go into it. You've got the presentation in front of you. I'll take you through it, starting with some big numbers alluded to uh, by, by Nick, at least, uh, to really, yes, yeah, set the stage. So uh, every year, OCHA and its partners puts together what's called the Global Humanitarian Overview. And that is a summary of all of the needs and the requirements to address those needs uh, across the world in all the largest crises. And, crises. and you'll see here, uh, for two, 2023, at the time of the launch, we had 339 million people in need and a financial requirement to address uh, those needs of $51.1 billion. Uh, even since then, it's gotten worse. Um, it's up by about 10% to 56 billion financial requirements now. Uh, and the people in need figure has risen to 361. They're huge numbers. Um, to put it in perspective, it's pretty, pretty uh, interesting to compare to the population of the United States. It's more than the population of the United States that are in need of humanitarian assistance globally today. And that works out, I'm told, 
to about one in 23 people. So on the financial side, uh, 56 billion is remarkable. Um, and that is the amount to assist only the most vulnerable 250 million people from within that count. Uh, and to grasp the magnitude of that, uh, that surpasses the combined GDP of over 100 countries in the world. So these comparisons really highlight the gravity of the situation we face. Um, and uh, of course, these estimates need to be credible and evidence-based. So that's what we're here to talk about. How do we do that? So uh, to answer that, we'll look a little more closely uh, at the humanitarian program cycle. I think I have decent animations here. Yeah. Uh, which uh, at its center has two key uh, pieces. Uh, the first being the humanitarian needs overview. And this is a coordinated assessment and analysis document that represents a huge collective process at the crisis level um, that is intended towards informing the strategic plan and the response for that crisis. And that is encapsulated within the humanitarian response plan. So as I said, these two documents and the processes that are undertaken to develop them are the key elements of this HPC, the humanitarian program cycle. And this, of course, is uh, led or convened by OCHA under its mandate. That's how I end up at the center of it. And then, of course, this all is rolled up into the global humanitarian overview, among other things. Uh, so back to the HNO. It's a comprehensive analysis, um, and it's intended to really understand and drive a collective agreement on the scale of the crisis, the severity of the crisis, the vulnerabilities of the affected people, and the drivers of the crisis. And it's through this joint analysis of primary data, like needs assessments and secondary data, uh, that urgent needs are identified along with the analysis of how these needs interact and often with very compounding effects. So I think we have next just a visualization of 2023 humanitarian needs and reviews, which are part of what goes into global humanitarian overview, the GHO. Um, and again, these HOs are done at the country level and they're critical to understanding needs uh, by assessing, analyzing, consolidating information. And we translate these needs into action uh, through the HRP. So last year, about 26 HNOs were published. Um, some countries engage in these practices, but do not publish for a variety of reasons. The number we usually use is between 25 to 30 in every given, any given year. Uh, so, similar process happening across up to 30 different countries. How do we guarantee that we have quality in the needs analysis? I think uh, our first speaker, Nick, had uh, <clears throat> alluded to this. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about uh, in the context of the joint and intersectoral analysis framework. So where does it come from before what it is, I guess you could say. Uh, starting back in 2016, so quite a while ago, we had something called the Grand Bargain. Uh, and one, it was an agreement reached between donors. Uh, it had 66 signatories. I don't have to tell some of you perhaps, 25 member states, 25 NGOs, 12 UN agencies, uh, and two Red Cross, Red Crescent movements. Uh, the there was one specific commitment within the grand bargain, and that was on needs assessment and the need to uh, enhance the quality uh, and standards of, of joint needs assessment, needs analysis. And this is called Workstream 5. <clears throat> and Workstream 5 is, was co-convened by OCHA and ECHO, again, putting us at the center of things. Um, so out of that Workstream 5 of the grand bargain came the joint an intersectoral analysis framework, or GF, as it's referred to. Um, 
which brought together about five donors, eight UN agencies, uh, all of the clusters, the Global Cluster Coordination Group, uh, and several NGOs and some specialist organizations like REACH and ACAPS to begin working on developing uh, the GF. So I'll just show you a little timeline here. So yeah, five years ago it began, um, around 2017, and the first version was launched uh, in 2019-2020. It went under, under refinements again in 2021, uh, and at this stage, uh, a large-scale uh, independent review was commissioned uh, and done by the Yale School of Public Health. Uh, and following that, and based on the outcomes of that uh, uh, review, uh, it went into revision again. So uh, the result now is uh, GF 2.0. Uh, which is aiming to set the global standard for analysis and estimation of humanitarian needs and protection risks. Uh, it builds on the lessons learned from day one. Um, it's been a two-year process to go from one to two, uh, and it has involved consultations, redesign, testing, learning, academic, applied research. Uh, it has been intense and comprehensive. So today we'll present the results of the process, this two-year process going from GF1 to GF2. Um, and uh, again, it, this involved more than 25 stakeholders along the way. So a good place to start now would be what is GF2? So first of all, global standards. Since uh, it's the result of two years process of consultation, redesign, testing, learning, incorporating insights from the academic applied research. Uh, it's been developed involving donors, UN agencies, clusters, all towards an agreed global standard. Uh, it will play a crucial role in informing strategic decision making, response analysis and response planning uh, across the humanitarian sector, particularly in the humanitarian program cycle. Uh, people centered. The GF recognizes that uh, individuals affected by crises have multiple needs and they're not always adequately defined by any single se sector's perspective. And so by considering this coexistence, this intersection of needs, the framework enables a comprehensive understanding of the humanitarian conditions that people face in crises. Robust analysis. So, sorry. Uh, and yeah, simple and fast yet rigorous. It's, um, sorry, I just got to catch up with my talking points here. Uh, I don't have one for that. It is a compromise, okay. It is it is built to be done in high stress, fast paced environments where people's time is being pulled in multiple different directions. Uh, it aims to achieve a strategic level understanding and to do so in a comparable and uh, consistent manner across crises. Um, and in that way, it also is embedded within uh, country processes like the HNO and is adaptable across crises, across different contexts. So how does it work? I believe this is where I hand off to Alex. Thank you very much. Sorry, thanks very much, Herbert. I was trying to get my camera back on. Um, thank you very much, not only for giving us a bit of the background of where the GIF came from and why it's been created, but then also the process leading up to GIF 2.0. Before I hand over to Alex, maybe just a quick question of clarification, because you talked about how the GIF links and can support the HNO, but there is a question in the Q&A around the multi-sectoral needs analysis that has been used, and this is particularly for uh, occupied Palestinian territories, can the GIF be used to analyze the results of a multi-sectoral needs analysis, or how do the two work together, or do they? 
Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, it's it's designed to be adaptable, and by that I mean adaptable to all sorts of different information environments. So if you are fortunate enough uh, in a crisis context to have a multi-sector needs assessment or MSNA that provides this uh, even fabric of household or close to it level information, yes, of course it can be adapted. Um, and that being said, uh, it can also be done in, in information constrained environments based on techniques around convergence of evidence and expert judgment, uh, but still follow the same sort of standards uh, that are being applied. Super. Thank you so much. And then I don't know if this was actually going to come up in Alex's or not, but as you mentioned, and Nick also mentioned, where the GIF 2.0 is coming at a time for the coming around in time for the 2024 cycle of the humanitarian program cycle of the HPC. However, somebody said, well, we've actually started working on our 2024 HPC HNO, well, more the HNO now. So is the GIF 2.0 going to be ready in order to kind of link into that process that may already be underway in some countries? I will start answering that question, and then I think I will hand over to Alex, the, the Perfect. project management unit, to to fill in any blanks I leave. It's it's been a, a tight delivery schedule, but it is delivered now. Uh, training has begun. Uh, I've already personally been involved in the training of trainers. I think Alex would probably be able to describe the training approach going forward. Uh, so, in the nick of time, I guess you could say for HPC 2024. Um, it is also important, I guess, to point out that the initial stages of needs uh, setting up an HNO, they don't really change much using this new instrument. It's all about scope setting and understanding uh, how we're going to approach things. Uh, so it's not too late Wonderful. To, to, to align, let's say. Ideally, everything would be done, you know, eight months and months before, but here we are. Over. <laughs> Like so many things in life, without the best, with, even with the best planning, it doesn't necessarily work exactly as we want it to. But great to hear that it's in time that it can be matched up with the H and O. Thank you so much, Herbert. Um, Alex, I'm going to hand over to you. Whether you want to kind of add anything to what Alex just and an sorry, what Herbert just Alex, what Herbert just answered in terms of the 2024 H uh, and O processes that have started, or if you're going to touch on that in your presentation, I'll hand over to you, please, Alex. I, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes, no, I can. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Manisha. And thank you, Marcus and Nick and um, Herbert uh, for the previous interventions. Um, I think, um, let me see, maybe I'll try to answer a little bit the question um, and then I'll complement that answer later at the end of, um, af at the, end of the slides that I'm presenting. So yes, there is a timeline, but this timeline can be somewhat flexible. We have seen actually in the training of trainer event that we had last week um, and some of the interventions from colleagues who said, okay, the, the timeline could be anything between two months uh, if, if the process is kind of known and if, if the context is such that everything is the same as in the previous years. So that would be protracted crisis. And then we heard other colleagues saying that it could be anything up to eight months, which is what Herbert was saying as well. So I think it depends a little bit on the country context, um, but generally we are not late. And what I'm going to explain to you, the elements of the analysis, you will see that the first parts of the analysis is something that probably most countries are already doing. So that we assume has already happened to some extent, and it's not new in GF 2.0 compared to what was in GF 1. So in that sense, I think we're quite on track and it's definitely, definitely doable for 2024. Um, and you will see some of the innovations and some of the changes that the methodology working group was proposing. And I think there is plenty of time to implement uh, those uh, for the cycle ahead. Okay, so let's now get to the basics of GF 2.0 tools and methods and unpack a little bit what is being uh, provided by the GF team. Um, to start with, uh, the let's understand a little bit how GF works. Um, and it works by providing an analysis framework, first and foremost. And this analysis for framework is organized around three modules that are covering both sectoral and intersectoral analysis. 
And each of these modules are serving a specific purpose in understanding humanitarian needs and in supporting um, analysts come to a certain type of um, analytical output. Uh, the first module here that you see contributing factors and scope is quite similar to GF1 uh, to the previous versions. In fact, it is building on previous year's practices and it continues to remain um, as it was done in the past and serve as the initial step in the analysis process. Um, uh, you will see that it's not significantly different to what has been done in the previous years. And in fact, most of the countries are already doing this and probably some of you have already completed this step. Uh, when it comes to the second module, we can say that this would be the most new part of GF uh, 2.0. It is uh, quite innovative and uh, it is introducing a new element by integrating sectoral needs analysis uh, into the entire analysis process. Um, so here with GF 2.0 analysis, we see that it is both a joint sectoral and intersectoral analysis. There are small nuance that maybe you have caught at the beginning that GF no longer stands for joint intersectoral analysis framework, but it stands for joint and intersectoral analysis framework. And this second module is a testament to that. Now we see that the sectoral needs um, analysis and the sectoral outputs are integrated and linked with the rest of the analysis, particularly intersectoral analysis. And this is also a result of uh, one of the, the comments that have been made by the Yale Review, but also some of the requirements from the field to link up the two different uh, sets of analysis. So GF 2.0 is addressing that with module two. Module three uh, is uh, contains somewhat adjustment methods and tools, but also some new elements. And we will unpack that a little bit uh, in the next uh, slide. So let's uh, look at it. Let's expand a little bit on the analysis framework and understand some of its components a little bit better. So for the contributing factors and scope, as I had mentioned earlier, the module has undergone minimal changes uh, based on uh, field uh, feedback. The methodology working group, the GF teams, endeavored to only adjust uh, elements where this was needed to keep continuity with practices in the field. So here, when you see the concepts, context, shock, and impact, you will realize that it's quite similar to what we had in GF, uh, in the previous versions of GF. This module continues to be uh, supporting a critical analysis and this is the space where uh, the country team comes together to frame their analysis in the same way and to ensure that they start from the same uh, page, that they understand the context, the environment that they operate in in the same way, that uh, they identify the key shocks and that they evaluate the main impacts that these shocks have on systems and populations. And based on that, then there's going to be a discussion around the setting of the scope of the analysis. Um, and this is done jointly um, in um, in one meeting or one workshop. To facilitate this, um, this analysis, what is new in GF 2.0 and what, what GF 2.0 provides, in addition to what was done in the past, is a toolkit to uh, support the teams collate and structure and synthesize this information. Moving on to module two, I mentioned that this is a very new model and it is one of the key value added uh, of GF 2.0. And here is where we ensure that the sectoral um, results, the sectoral outputs are interoperable. And why do we need these sectoral outputs to be interoperable? Is because the analysis that the clusters are doing using their own sector specific tools and their own methods uh, needs to be brought together and it needs to, um, and it needs to fall in place and um, enable um, a, a shared, uh, in, enable understanding a, a coherent picture of the situation in the country. And in order for us to be able to, to do that, we need to make sure that these outputs are interoperable. So the sectoral outputs become eventually an input into the overall GF um, analysis in the, and they, they become an input into the intersectoral uh, needs analysis as well. So for the sectoral outputs conducted with different methods, uh, or arrived at uh, using different methods, 
uh, for them to be uh, brought together for the intersectoral analysis, they need to be interoperable. So at global level, clusters have agreed on um, some references to ensure interoperability of the PIN figures and some global references to ensure the interoperability of sectoral severity. Uh, and then finally, the third module, uh, here I mentioned that we have some adjustments to the previous methods and some new elements. So the uh, overall PIN, the, the estimation uh, for the PIN is adjusted and we will get into the details on, on what that is. And the intersectoral severity uh, is a completely new method um, that, that GF 2.0 is putting forward. And it is no longer based on uh, a mathematical formula, mathematical formula or some kind of aggregation rules, but it is based on convergence of evidence. And finally, this module is also supporting a stronger intersectoral um, analysis, which is supported by visual aids um, and analysis outputs to enable the country team and the analysts to draw conclusions on the characteristics of needs. So these needs patterns is, is, a, is an addition, um, a new uh, element uh, that GF 2.0 brings into, um, into the picture. Um, now you see that uh, we also, you see that each of these modules has their own toolkit. So what are these toolkits? So each module has a supporting toolkit that includes several elements uh, to enable the analysts to conduct the analysis and arrive at the required results, right? So module one, contributing factors and scope has a toolkit number one. Module two, sectoral needs, has a toolkit number two. And module three, intersectoral needs, has its own toolkit number three. Now, each of these toolkits uh, have workspaces. What are the workspaces? The workspaces are structured spaces for analysis and where there is data input. And these can be made up of tables, text boxes, drop-down selections, checkboxes, boxes where people have to write narrative. So it depends very much on what module we're in, but essentially the workspace is where the analysis happens, where input is being provided um, as a result of different discussions or analysis processes or review of data sources. Now, how to do that uh, input, how to fill in the workspaces, for that, we are going to look at reference tables, right? So reference tables are global uh, standards, common globally comparable benchmarks. And these are the um, structured information that helps, that guides the analyst to complete the workspaces. Further, uh, in addition to these toolkits, there is a uh, technical guidance. And this technical guidance uh, provides, at, at minimum, it will provide an overview, which will be relevant to all the stakeholders and provides a general understanding of GF 2.0. And the second part is uh, more technical, and it includes a step-by-step -step guidance to empower the analysts to conduct these analyses. So this step-by-step -step guidance will unpack a little bit the toolkits, will unpack the workspaces, and the reference tables and how to utilize them, how to interpret them, and, and how to essentially uh, get to the GF 2.0 outputs. A fourth element, in addition to the analysis framework, which guides the analysis, the toolkits, which are the instruments with which we do the analysis, and the technical guidance, which helps explain how to do that. In addition to that, GF 2.0 also provides an online analysis platform. And that platform is the one-stop place for analysts in the country, that is the um, members of the ACCG and the members of the IM working group uh, or assessment working group. So essentially uh, the cluster system and relevant um, assessment partners who are engaging in this joint analysis. So this is a space for them, uh, uh, which is online cloud-based um, and it's a space for them to um, conduct joint participatory evidence-based and transparent analysis. It has several functions and it allows, it includes all the workspaces that need to be completed by the analyst along with links for the reference tables that, uh, that are there to guide, uh, guide the process. And it also includes uh, visualizations, um, so graphics and charts and um, 
which are populated in real time and are also uh, enabling the analysts to make conclusions and uh, interpret some of the information uh, collected, compiled uh, into the platform in the analysis process. So these are the, um, this is how GF works, right? Through an analysis framework, having the toolkits, having the guidance and having this analysis uh, platform. Now, the type of information that it provides, um, there are several um, outputs, but to name the core ones, the most relevant ones uh, for the humanitarian needs overview document, these would be five. And it's essentially the key drivers and characteristics of those most affected. So this is where we're looking at which population groups and geographical areas are the most affected, what are some of the drivers of the conflict, which uh, shock is causing what impact on what vulnerable population, so an explanation of these drivers, uh, why a crisis is happening, what's the underlying context. So this is the kind of information that, uh, or kind of analysis that is going to result from GF 2.0, particularly module number one, if you remember the analysis framework um, from a few slides back. The second uh, element is a more interoperable estimation of sectoral needs. Uh, again, just to highlight that we have the sectoral uh, outputs. So the sectoral analysis using their own methods, using their own indicators and approaches, they generate some outputs that become an input into the uh, GF uh, process. And we have some tools to make these inputs um, interoperable. And the third uh, information, key information that is being provided is a joint overall uh, number of people in need of humanitarian assistance and protection that you are very familiar with already, uh, I'm sure, from all the previous um, analysis processes and, and HNOs. And then fourth one is the severity of humanitarian condition, which is known as intersectoral severity um, by many of us. And finally, the fifth uh, type of um, output uh, is linkages and patterns, understanding a little bit how, uh, what are some of the outliers, what are some of the connections between the different sectors, do we see some trends, do we see some patterns in the needs. Um, so that's essentially uh, coming uh, together from from module three, but also going back and linking back up to module one uh, contributing factors. And now we will see how each of them um, will provide a bit of an overview on how each of them looks like and how, how it works. How is this information produced? Uh, but for more detail, we will recommend you to uh, check the manual when it will be published. So for the key drivers and characteristics of those most affected, we are now situated in module number one, contributing factors and scopes. And we have the toolkit for that with the workspace and the reference table, right? And here, what we're trying to um, bring together is the context information, the environment we're operating in, the shocks, the impact on systems and population groups, which then helps us determine the scope of the analysis. And you will see, as I mentioned, that this is not new, and many of the countries are already doing this very, very well. Um, I put some um, print screens uh, on the right-hand side that shows you how this has been done in Colombia, for example, for the vulnerable groups, or how context and um, impact uh, information was organized when it comes to access in Somalia. And these are some of the examples of, uh, of outputs that we can have from uh, using this module number one. And I mentioned briefly that is a preliminary uh, initial analysis, and then we also have a final analysis. So, this is a continuous work. So we start uh, from the same page um, um, in one initial workshop uh, that kickstarts the analysis process. But as we go along with the analysis, the information gets to be updated in case there are new shocks, new information um, uh, comes into, into play. Number two, we were discussing about interoperability. So this is how uh, the... Um, this is what I noted at the beginning is one of the key innovations of GF 2.0, and it's the ability to make the sectoral needs analysis interoperable. So the global clusters in collaboration with their field teams have agreed to common guidelines 
for both the people in need figures and severity estimations and have developed operational guidance for their respective clusters analysis. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I will take, for example, uh, the severity. Uh, we know that uh, each cluster will uh, estimate severity in a different manner, right? What we have now in GF 2.0, a clear understanding that for each of the clusters, phase five means sectoral collapse, which means that when four, five, six clusters produce a severity five for an area, we know that most of those, uh, well, that all of those sectors are in, in this uh, collapse phase, right? So complete inability of people to access the, the required service or that the, the services are simply not available. And in this way, we can uh, basically bring together different clusters, different methods, different indicators under the same meaning. So now we know that phase five means sectoral collapse for um, everyone. So by standardizing the meanings, the analysis results can come together and we can paint a more coherent presentation um, of sector-specific findings and more meaningful intersectoral analysis, right? So this helps us now conduct overlap of sectoral needs um, analysis and understand a little bit more the linkages. And this happens in module two, as you see here on the uh, top right of the, of the PowerPoint. And there's tools, uh, reference uh, tables uh, for the PIN and reference table for the severity, as well as workspaces to record um, any contextualization or adaptation, which is possible at country level. Number three, uh, we are now uh, discussing the joint overall uh, number of people in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. So we have moved now to module three. Module three has three components, just as a small recap, overall pin, intersectoral severity, and linkages. So we are now in the first component of module number three, and that is uh, overall, uh, joint overall pin uh, figures. So in GF 2.0, uh, the, the GF 2.0 team is proposing what we what is called mosaic method. So that means that the overall pin figure comes from combining the highest sectoral pins uh, that have been validated by partners at the lowest unit of analysis to which there is reliable evidence. So in practice, in module number one, in the conversations you have had there in the country, there has been an agreement on the unit of analysis that is being assessed, right? So that could be admin one, admin two, and also potentially disaggregated by population groups. So at that lowest unit of analysis, there is going, going to be different sectoral inputs with different pin figures, right? So the highest sectoral pin is taken for that unit of analysis. This is not something that is new uh, for many of you especially the IMOs, I'm sure will recognize some elements. However, what is new is that this figure will not be taken um, by default. It has to be validated by partners uh, who are sitting together and discuss these figures. Um, and in order to validate, there are certain mechanisms, tools, um, reference tables that are being provided to enable this discussion. And there is basically what, what, we, what we call automated and also the possibility to add some manual flags. So this will highlight uh, some inconsistencies, some outliers, some things that require further conversation. It doesn't mean that what's highlighted is an error, but it means that it requires a little bit more scrutiny from the entire, um, from the entire group. So the numbers are validated together jointly by the analysis team. And then the flags are addressed. And once this is done, then uh, the, the highest pin is taken for the unit of analysis. And then they come together and they generate this overall pin figure. So that's the change, the improvement of the, the method uh, that is being proposed for the joint overall pin. The intersectoral severity uh, is a completely new approach uh, to what has been done in the past but it is not new in general um, in, because it is utilized in many fields, right? Medical fields and in law and, and other um, areas as well. It is based on convergence of evidence. So as opposed to aggregations and mathematical formulas, the severity information, the intersectoral severity information, the understanding of the severity of the humanitarian condition is done through a convergence of evidence process. So, 
the GIAF team uh, defined intersectoral severity as the degree of humanitarian needs and protection risks that populations face relative to agreed humanitarian standards based on universal humanitarian outcomes, regardless of the causes, context, and sectoral specific dynamics. So the intersectoral severity is centered around humanitarian outcomes. So how an individual experiences the impact of a crisis, right? So what is, it, it's, it's very much people-centered in that sense. It's like, it, it's, it's looking at how the individual is experiencing uh, how, how he or she feels, irrespective of whether the deprivation is coming from one sector or another, or it is directly linked to a vulnerability or to the context. So how, how this analysis is being done, uh, GF 2.0 proposes a preliminary severity determined based on overlap of sectoral severities. And this is to facilitate the work of the analysts because research has shown that generally when there is an overlap of sectoral severities, so let's say many fives, uh, phases five, which is sectoral collapse come together, then generally that it correlates with an intersectoral severity five as well. It's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but generally uh, it correlates, right? So then the method is proposing a first um, severity score that comes out from an overlap of sectoral severities. But because we know it's not a one-on-one -on -one correlation, this is flagged for inconsistencies with universal humanitarian outcomes. So what does that mean? It means that the scores here are compared to um, uh, results or data uh, for five indicators that measure humanitarian outcomes, conditions, right? So not necessarily a deprivation, but, uh, but an outcomes such as death or risk of death, acute malnutrition, um, irreversible um, harm. Um, so, so in general, yes, outcomes. So the two sets of data are compared. And if, if the information is not converging, then there's going to be a consensus building process, convergence of evidence process, again, with all of the analysts, all of the, the members of the, in the country who are conducting this analysis to, to discuss and to bring in more evidence and to understand how the area should be classified. Uh, if the findings converge, so the overlap of sectoral severities points to a certain severity, let's say five or four, and the humanitarian outcomes, the indicators, also point to the same severity, then this is taken as the final classification for the phase. Um, and then there's going to be, during the convergence of evidence process for the areas where there is um, where there are discrepancies, additional evidence can be used, including going back to what was collected in contributing factors, module number one, so contextual information, what do we know about the situation in, in the area, um, it perhaps it's more poor, perhaps, perhaps there's a, a big number of IDPs burdening the services, so it could be anything that, that contributes to increasing or decreasing the severity of an area, so that is also considered. So that's the intersectoral severity and more details in the manual when it will be available. And finally, uh, the linkages. Uh, this is also the third element in the third module. And this is done through visual prompts, which is what you see on the right-hand side, some graphics, bars, maps, and also questions that, the, that prompt the, the team to have certain conversations um, and explore the data further and investigate what's happening in a given area, in a given situation, or, or overall in the country, right? So I put here some examples of questions, what sectors have the highest spin, what sectors have the highest severity, like how do things overlap, there's, a, there's also some graphs looking at correlations and trends. So all of this is uh, provided automatically through the platform, the visuals and the questions to enable the a, a given country to have this conversation and derive some conclusions. And I think in a nutshell, this is it. We've covered all of the workspaces and the reference tables and the toolkits for the modules. Um, so I hope that's, uh, that's clear and open to questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Alex, for that overview. And I think that was a lot of information. And as you said, the tools are coming out and the resources will be available. So people will be able to see what was in all of those details. But just a couple of questions, maybe uh, of clarification. You mentioned analysts a lot. So just wondering who are those analysts and who would be the ones who would be filling in the different kind of levels of information? And also at a, a more detailed question, I guess, is number of questions around how the GIF is going to, you know, the people-centered approach has been mentioned many times. Listening to you in terms of where all that information is coming in and how it's being analyzed, how are people and communities being involved and really being part of the process to identify what the needs are? So um, I think we're using analysts as sort of a catchment term, uh, and maybe I should have explained that a little bit from the beginning. Um, so when we say analysts, we mean, we really mean the people who are conducting the analysis in the field. And that would be in practice, the, the people who are also making some of the strategic decisions. So that would be some of the coordinators who are guiding the process uh, with the partners, right? So th that would be the cluster coordinators, the cluster co-coordinators in consultation with their partners, who are also doing some of the data gathering and evidence gathering. And then we also, I also include here the information management officers who are also um, in some context crunching the data, in some context interpreting the data, um, in some context collecting some of the data, generating the map. So we have very different functions among the, uh, the technical people as well. And then I'm also including some of the program people and um, specialized assessment agencies, and that could be anything from the vulnerability and um, VAM from WFP, vulnerability and, and assessments, I think. Uh, I, sorry, I, just I, remember the, I just remember the abbreviation. I'm very sorry about that. But also DTM colleagues, so the displacement tracking metrics, and also the REACH colleagues. So generally, any partner that is uh, collecting large-scale data and has large data sets to contribute to these kind of processes would also be part of this group. And to conclude a little bit in practice, this is because GF 2.0 is organized to support analysis uh, within existing structures and systems, right? So if we have an intercluster coordination group or an information management working group, assessment working groups and structures like this, then this would be the group where the analysis would be conducted. And they are the analysts in this case. Super, thank you for that. And it, the VAM is the vulnerab vulnerability assessment mapping, which several people have pointed out. Thank you so and, much. And then, and then also in terms of that kind of more people-centered approach, the way you've just described it, Alex, it sounds like those who are going to be contributing to the GIF and doing the analysis are generally uh, those who are in clusters, decision makers in humanitarian organizations. Are they the ones who are supposed to do that kind of participatory engagement with affected communities, or is there something in the GIF that helps improve and uh, kind of furthers? Yeah, as somebody asked, how will the GIF improve the people-centered approach? Um, yeah, so I think this is not a, an easy question to answer, and it goes a little bit beyond uh, the joint intersectoral, joint and intersectoral analysis framework. Honestly, it probably is applicable to the entire program cycle. Um, but there are many ways in which communities and assessment uh, affected people can be brought into the conversation. And some of it, as you rightly pointed out, Manisha, is done through the partners who engage with the communities um, on the ground and who collect some of this evidence, because evidence can also be a field report, right? Um, or some kind of reports coming in that this, inf this is happening, this phenomenon is happening, or this need is happening. So that is also a piece of evidence. And this is, this is one way in which that information, that voice it can, can make it up to the, to the chain, to the assessment group or analysis group, right? Um, there are um, other ways um, around uh, there, if there are monitoring mechanisms in place in the country and that information can also feed into the, into the GF 2.0 framework. So, or for example, uh, reach uh, MSNAs, I know have an entire AAP section, uh, indicators and questions that are also included in their assessments. Um, and that information is also taken and analyzed um, Generally, that is useful for informing a response more than the actual needs, but that information is there. Um, 
yeah, many, many ways in which they can be, uh, they can be involved. Super. Thank you. And there's still, I think there's still a little bit of confusion around the link between the JIAF and the MSNA, like the multi-sectoral needs assessments. But I, I think as uh, Alex had mentioned, uh, or no, it was Herbert, sorry. You can use what comes out of a, a multi-sector needs analysis in the JIAF analysis. Is that correct? Or, you know, people are saying sort of, why don't we just replace the MSNA with a JIAF? Or I think it's just kind of clarifying where does the JIAF fit in regards to these different assessments. And there was another question, why can't we have one assessment across the board, which I think is a bigger question perhaps than being able to answer here. I think if you ask different sectors, they would definitely not necessarily say you could have one across the system, but how does it kind of um, link, I guess, with the MSNA? And I also see Herbert's raised his hand, or I mean, now he's put it down. I don't know. Yeah, so MSNA is one source of information. Yeah. It could be the main one in some country contexts if everyone relies on it, or it could be just one out of many, or it could not be there, right, at all. So you have different country contexts, and some may have MSNAs, some don't, and it's just one of, of multiple sources of information. And the joint and intersectoral analysis framework is not an, an, a data collection process. It is tools and methods to conduct the analysis with whatever information you have available in the country. It could be secondary data or it could be primary data. It could come from MSNAs. It could come from other reports. The, the whole intent behind the joint um, and uh, intersectoral analysis framework is to provide the tools for people to be able to do this analysis in both data poor and the data rich um, environments as well. Um, and I don't know, Herbert, if you want to complement um, on this. No, we won't, won't take any more time. You, you summed it up well. Thanks. Super. Thank you very much, Alex. I think that really helps clarify that it is that, you know, you take the analysis from where, or sort of the information from wherever it may come, and then you jointly do that analysis so you can have a better idea of what the number of people in need are and also the severity um, by sector sectors as well. Um, there, there was also one other question. What do you do when there are no clusters or sectors? In, a, in an operation. I'm guessing those are refugee situations and that would be where UNHCR's coordination role comes in, but maybe. Um, no, very much, very much. So if it's a refugee situation, then uh, indeed the UNHCR mechanisms would kick in. Um, our, I guess the, the, the vision of the methodology working group and the joint advisory group um, and perhaps even higher is that this is um, a system um, of analysis tools and methods that can be used in any crisis, in any context, for any kind of humanitarian analysis. But I think we have a little bit of um, a journey to make to get there. So let's first uh, see um, how it works in um, contexts where we have, in contexts where we have um, humanitarian program cycle, and that is to say HNOs and HRPs, um, where things are, are a little bit more stable. Generally, you have cluster systems and, uh, and kind of like a whole mechanism and support around it. So they would be now the primary, uh, the primary group to implement uh, GIAF. But it is indeed envisioned that this could become, in time, one of the more the main um, humanitarian an analysis um, methods and, and tools and mechanism. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Christina. Uh, sorry, Alex, I was looking at my notes too fast. Really appreciate that overview of that. And now I'm going to hand over to Christina, who's going to tell us a bit how the GF 2.0 is being rolled out and implemented, which I think will answer a number of questions that are coming up in the Q&A. So Christina, over to you, please. To Manisha and hi, everyone. Okay, I'm um, not sure I can. Oh, yes, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so how the GF 2.0 is implemented at country level? As you know, as you've heard, uh, GF 2.0 is fully integrated into the humanitarian program cycle. And for this reason, also its implementation is closely aligned with the HPC timeline. And this includes actually the deadline for the global humanitarian overview that probably many of you are familiar with, the end of October. Uh, the GF implementation process sees um, three main multi-partner workshops that are the colored boxes that you see in the slide. Uh, and these are integrated with sectoral processes that are shown in gray. 
multi-partner workshops are actually not new to the humanitarian community. So probably many of you have already participated in such workshops. And so for some countries, the process that is described here will not be a novelty at all. Uh, however, conscious of the multiple tasks that country teams have, we have tried to keep the process as light as possible. Um, and we are estimating uh, that the three GIAF multi-partner workshops together will take approximately five days, in addition to the usual standard sectoral processes that are already existing. Um, one of the most important features of GIAF 2.0 is actually its collaborative approach. So the active participation of the analysts, and uh, Alex was explaining what we mean by analysts, so all the cluster coordinators, the information management officers, relevant experts, so their participation is strongly required. And it is exactly through the expertise of diverse stakeholders that GIAF can ensure the comprehensive and informed analysis. So each partner also has very specific responsibility and roles that will be described in the GIAF technical manual. But in a nutshell, uh, national clusters, as we have seen, will run their own analysis together with the partners. OCHA will coordinate the overall process, so the joint and intersectoral process of the GIAF. And other technical partners, uh, civil society, NGOs will support all the analysis, whether sectoral analysis or intersectoral uh, as applicable. So now I'll see if I can, yes, okay, show you the GF governance at global level. Um, so as we have seen, GF is an interagency partnership. The coordination of it will be done by OCHA um, and specifically NARAS, so the Needs Assessment and Response Analysis section in Geneva. Uh, NARAS will serve as the secretariat uh, for the GIAF and will also coordinate all the activities. And then you can see on the left, these three different levels uh, that are the ways in which global partners can contribute or actually do contribute to the GIAF. So global partners provide strategic guidance through the steering committee that you see at the top in green. Uh, they also provide technical advisory at the senior level through the, the JAG, what we call the JAG, so the Joint Advisory Group. And then there is the methodology working group, which supports all the trainings and will also support the analysis at country level. We'll see that in a while. And the methodology working group also recommends technical developments that will afterwards be decided upon by the joint advisory group. Okay, quality assurance. Um, so there's multiple ways in which uh, uh, the quality of the GIAF analysis will be ensured. Um, and this is done basically through three, well, through different components that can be grouped in three stages. So ahead of the rollout, there were already some initiatives taken to ensure quality of the GIAF analysis. And these are the definition of global standards and guidelines uh, that Alex has described a bit, and you will find more details about it in the GIAF manual and in the toolkits. Uh, these guidance are also used for the trainings of the analyst, and we will look at it also in a bit. And so, and these are the orange cycle circles that you see on, on the slide, uh, which is what has happened ahead of the rollout. During the process of the rollout and during the implementation phase, you see the green circles. Uh, we will have two different uh, uh, ways of ensuring quality of the analysis. On one side, the use of multi-partner workshops. And this is meant to guarantee uh, that all discussions, all agreements are derived transparently and based on evidence. And for the evidence-based part, it is also very important to note that online platform, analysis platform that has been mentioned, uh, which will allow real-time uh, analysis, but also participatory and transparent analysis. Uh, lastly, after the rollout uh, and during the implementation phase, so the circles in purple on the slide, a uh, mechanism will be um, available to ensure that the country analysts can adhere to the GIAF standards uh, and they can hence produce the needs analysis in the rigorous and impartial way that we want them to be. Uh, the two mechanisms are on one side, the day-to-day -day technical troubleshooting, which will be provided by OCHA and the global clusters. And this will include both remote support and deployments to countries. And then also the use of a help desk uh, as interagency in-depth support, 
mostly for contentious analysis. So in a few words, if there is a break of consensus at country level on the implementation of the GIAF methods or processes or tools, partners can contact the GIAF help desk and they will receive some guidance from the methodology working group, which would be the main body uh, providing this guidance. And now we look at the training strategy, so the capacity uh, development strategy for the GIAF. Okay, so the, first of all, the objective of the training strategy is to really provide the OCHA cluster teams, partner staffs with the necessary knowledge and the skills also to conduct the joint and intersectoral analysis using GIAF methods and tools. So this will be done with the cascading approach, and this is the pyramid that you see on the slide. So at the top, and sorry, so at the top, you will see the global experts. So uh, global experts are uh, the partners who have attended a global TOT, training of trainers, and have gained in-depth knowledge and also facilitation skills. And they will be responsible for training their regional and country counterparts and also co-facilitate the analysis at country level. And then in the middle, um, you see we have country and regional experts. Uh, so those are practitioners at country or regional level who will attend also another TOT at regional level and will then deliver the same training to their country peers. They will also co-facilitate the analysis in their own country. And then lastly, uh, you see country analysts, which means everybody will be actively involved in the GIAF analysis process. So again, we're talking about the cluster coordinators, information management officers, other analysts and experts. Uh, they will attend the GIAF trainings, which will be delivered in country. They will acquire all the knowledge and skills that are necessary to conduct the GIAF analysis, but they will not have any further responsibility to cascade down the training. So it's important to mention that on top of this um, pyramid here and this system that I've just described, there will be also training materials and videos that will be made available on the GIAF website. Uh, so anyone, any one of you who is joining today or also who will listen to this recording later on and is interested in learning more about the GIAF, uh, please stay tuned, check the web page uh, for, for updates. And I'm actually going to show you the GIAF uh, website. So this is the link for the GIAF website. You will find all the information related to GIAF developments, all the training materials and resources will also be there, the manuals, etc. Feel free also to... Um, uh, subscribe for the mailing list uh, and the link will be available on the website uh, and to share also this link with the colleagues who you think might be interested in GIAF. And I think that's it from me today. Thank you, Manisha. Over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, let me just start my video again. Thank you very much for that overview and great to hear that the training is being rolled out. There was a question about whether the materials will be available in Arabic. Because I saw somewhere that English, good. Spanish, and French are coming. Yeah, good question. Maybe, uh, I don't know if Alex or Herbert, because um, I think they are a bit more Fair <laughs> enough, sorry. knowledgeable about the translation part. Um, yes. So can you hear me? Yes. I'm coming in. Uh, this is um, Alex. Um, we are uh, working on translations uh, for French and Spanish was the priority. Um, right now, um, there is no immediate um, plan to translate them in Arabic, uh, not until, let's say, July. But we do have it in our minds, uh, in the back of our minds, and we would love to have them translated in Arabic as well at some point. Uh, but for sure, what we can guarantee now to the community is French, Spanish and English. Super. And I guess that links to another question as to it, where are the where is the GIF going to be used in the HPC 2024 process? If the Arabic translations are not coming out until later, does that mean it's only going to be in other countries or what's the plan around that? Swan, just just to say that the trainings, so as, as you've seen, there is a cascading approach for, for trainings, right? And for passing on knowledge. So the TOTs will be delivered in English and the material will be available in English. But then in countries, in Arabic speaking countries, the in-country training itself and the discussion can also happen in local language, so in Arabic. And it's the same is true for other languages as well. So I would expect maybe in Myanmar 
to have some of the discussions around the GIAF could possibly be in local language or in Mozambique, they could be in Portuguese. So it's it's just, let's say, the, the side of training and capacity development of those who will be responsible for the GIAF analysis will and for training and capacity building will be in English, French or Spanish. But then uh, the in-country discussions and, and trainings can also be in other languages as well. So there shouldn't be any restriction in that sense in terms of where the GIAF can be applied. Super. Thanks so much. And there was also some questions sort of around these five universal outcome indicators. Who's going to be selecting them country level or is that determined by the GIF team? Mm-hmm. Alex, Christina, if you want to come in, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. So the, the indicators have been defined by the methodology working group. Um, however, we know that some kind of contextualization is possible in the sense that sometimes direct evidence exactly on those indicators is not available and country teams will be able to find, let's say, proxies for those indicators so they will be able to uh, adjust a little bit. Wonderful. Alex, Thanks so you may want to Sorry. complement. No, I think that's uh, that's uh, that's pretty clear. Um, so we do have direct evidence. Uh, we recommend uh, finding data sources for these five indicators. Um, and the, the methodology working group has put forward specific thresholds as well. Um, so if that is possible, that would be preferred, right? That is more solid information and more robust analysis. However, we know that uh, some of the some of the indicators or some of the data would be difficult to acquire. And in this case, indirect evidence is also possible. So or what what Christina mentioned um, as proxy indicators as well. And I guess that links, thank you both for that. I, I guess that links to another question that was there in terms of how can the GIF help in calculating the people in need number when there's no quantitative data available? I guess talking again about that data poor environment that you had mentioned before, Alex. So the difference, uh, because I think some colleagues were also asking in the chat, what's the difference between GIF 1.0? Point one and GF 2.0, right? So one of the key differences is that in GF 2.0, there's a, um, an increased emphasis on sectoral inputs. And the sectoral inputs are becoming, uh, to some extent, in some at the beginning of the pink um, estimation and severity estimation, they are the building blocks, right? Further than triangulated, checked, validated, and so on. So uh, the expectation would be that the sectors would be able to come up with the PIN estimates. That's the ingredients that go into the overall PIN. So th- we cannot have an overall PIN if we don't have PIN uh, sectoral people in need figures. Now, to answer the question um, on how, what we do in data poor environments, we would have to give you eight different answers for eight different clusters because they would have their own different um, methodologies, right? And we know that a lot of the clusters are having already, even in data-rich environment, quite a qualitative approach, right? With a lot of data sources being brought in and some expert judgment conversations. And it's not always indicator heavy. It's not always a mathematical estimation that we're just like putting in some data, press a button, and then the figures come out the other end, right? It does require some thinking. It does require some field validation. um, And a lot of the sectors already have that built into their own processes. Um, And I think each sector might have very different um, approaches on on handling uh, data poor environments. I don't know, Christina, as as from the clusters, if you want to come in with, with that perspective from food security, maybe. Yeah, I can confirm that um, classes we have defined anyway, uh, some estimate, estimation methodology, the best possible according to the sectoral standards. What I believe is also um, important to mention is that the GIAF process will actually help through the sharing of this information, of this analysis, and sort of cross-checking triangulation to also adjust when needed and to come up with a realistic PIN figure for the country overall, right? So the overall uh, GF PIN. So it's um, GF doesn't provide the magic solution, <laughs> but um, we don't foresee major issues in coming up with GF uh, outcomes in uh, data poor countries. Thanks very much. And there, are, there's a couple of questions in here around sort of how useful is the GF outside of the HPC process, like the HNO, the HRPs. 
like somebody asked a question around, is it relevant for private sector actors? Uh, and I guess that question also then links to how much of the evidence and analysis from other from different assessments can be inputted and who's going to be inputting all that analysis into the kind of GIF tools that are there so that you are able to undertake that joint analysis. And I guess that links also to another question that somebody had, which ha somebody said, and which there was a partial answer to, if I could now find it again, but basically saying, generally this tool uses already generated information from other tools. So what's the real benefit? And uh, Lynn Oshikawa, thank you for your suggestion and said, I'd expect the benefit to be bringing all the different assessments to develop a shared picture of humanitarian needs. So just to maybe clarify, is that what the benefit is of the GIF or you know, if there's all this analysis going on anyway, I guess the question really was, you know, why bother going through another process that adds, as you said, another five days to the process in addition to what goes on in the different sectors? Yeah, um, I think indeed the, the idea behind the joint any textual analysis is to make sure that we have a common understanding of the humanitarian situation. The final objective uh, of the GIAF, or the primary objective, if you want, is really to inform the strategic decision making, right? And the response planning, the response analysis. But in order to do that, you need to make sure that you have a solid, evidence-based, comprehensive analysis. And when we talk about comprehensive analysis of humanitarian needs, we go back a little bit to the idea of people-centered as well, right? It's not just sectoral analysis. So of course, sector processes will provide good information, hopefully good information about sectoral needs and will allow to define sectoral responses. But it's only through this joint process that you can have a common understanding of the situation, how the different needs interact among themselves, uh, linkages, patterns, trends, and all this. And through this overall view uh, and analysis of the situation, we are able to actually uh, design the best possible humanitarian response through the next step, which is indeed response analysis and planning uh, during the HRP um, cycle. Super, thank you, Christina. There's another question here also, you know, if the process can take anywhere from two to eight months, how do you make sure that the analysis remains relevant? And is there a way to make sure the analysis can be done in a continuous way to feed into real-time decision-making, especially when the dynamics in a crisis can change? Mm -hmm. um, so during actually the process itself, uh, there is the possibility, and that's what is foreseen like this, to go back to the initial steps of the analysis and adjust them. So Alex has talked about, and we have seen also in the process, the first uh, uh, multi-partner workshop in which there is the first analysis, preliminary analysis about the context, the shocks, and the impacts. And this is usually done early in the year. However, later on, things can happen and the analyst will be required to go back into that module and update it based on the most recent information that are available. And the idea is that when the GIAF analysis is completed and the HNO launched, so let's remember that the GIAF is meant to feed mostly the HNO, the analysis is as relevant as possible for the situation in the country at that point in time. What happens after the HNO is published, that's another story, but definitely the framework of the GIAF can help the humanitarian community, so the, the country teams, to update the information. We are not requesting, of course, official updates of these tools and, um, and, and the outputs of the GIAF, but uh, in many countries, um, when major shocks occur or situation change drastically, uh, the humanitarian country team decides to do um, an HRP revision, sometimes an HNO, uh, but even without an HNO revision, the HRP will require updated information on the needs. And the GIAF frameworks and tools could help to come up with uh, some of those revised um, inputs. Super, thank you very much. Uh, somebody was asking if the Yale independent review of the first version of the GIAF is available, and if so, could you share the link in the chat? I'm guessing it's public. I'm hoping it's public. I think maybe Herbert, you want to take that. Uh, I'm not sure it was ever published uh, kind of on the World Wide Web. Yeah, I don't know if it has a home anywhere, but it's available. It's not uh, embargoed or anything like that. I don't think I'll be able to furnish the link in time for this presentation, though, but I can follow up with it for sure. 
Thanks very much, Herbert. And we will, just for those who are asking, the not only will the recording and the presentations be available on the webpage after this, we'll also have the responses to the questions that have been written, uh, That because there's been a number that have been answered, but those will also be available there. There was a question also, and I think this is an, an important one maybe to come back to, is what does estimation of protection risks in addition to humanitarian needs mean in the context of the GIF 2.0? And how does it link with some of the guidance and framework that ha- frameworks that have been developed over the past three years, including the GPC endorsed protection analytical framework. And I'm guessing again, that this is, as you all mentioned, you know, you're getting analysis from different sectors and that feeds into the GIF. And I guess linked to that is a question about when you have all these different assessments, even if they're, you know, individual organizational assessments, how do you get all that information into the GIF tool? Is it just, you know, a couple of people who have access to that tool or is it anybody who can put all their information in when they do an analysis? So you have rolling information that's there, as you mentioned, Christina, you know, who's the one that's going to be kind of the the virtual pen holder in a way? I can start with this last part of the question and then pass it to Alex, who might be more knowledgeable about the protection than than me. Um, So, Clusters are going to be part of the GIF analysis process. And uh, by default, what the clusters do when they do their sectoral analysis is that they collect all available assessments, information, reports from their cluster partners. Uh, So again, it's going to be a sort of cascading this time up (laughs) process. So all the different partners will share their analysis and information with the uh, corresponding clusters. And the cluster coordinator, the cluster information management officer will be responsible to contribute whatever they have into the GIF analysis. The platform itself will be mostly filled, I believe, by a few people, so the tool, uh, but this is just, let's say, technical side of it. But the information is meant to be as wide and comprehensive as possible. Uh, thanks to all partners. And it's really leveraging the presence of partners across the country uh, that we can ensure the, the quality and the comprehensiveness of the um, of the GIF analysis. Uh, what I can say about protection is only the uh, protection colleagues define needs in a different way. And this is why we talk about protection risks and not protection needs. <laughs> this I'm sure I can answer on the linkages between the GIF and the PATH. Maybe Alex, you want to take it? Sure, no problem. Um, I think you can still hear me. Uh, I, I'm not muted. Perfect. Okay. Um, actually, we've done a lot of work with the general protection uh, cluster colleagues at global level, and we're very happy to say that protection and the, the, the notion of centrality of protection um, is coming out quite strongly in the entire GF 2.0 um, approach. So there is an element of protection um, analysis um, in the first module, right? The contributing factors. We talk about the context, we talk about the shocks, and we talk about the impact. So when we talk about the context, we can have an environment that we know is full of protection risks, right? So I don't know, for example, rape is used as a as a weapon um, and other sort of um, elements like this or violations are happening. That is definitory for the context in which humanitarians are operating. Same for lack of access or besieged areas. It is another definitory element of, of the environment that the humanitarians are operating in, being able or not being able to access some communities. So these are all... Uh, elements of protection analysis that come at the forefront in that initial workshop, initial conversation of understanding the context, the shocks, and uh, and the impact. Uh, displacement is another one, and um, with with uh, people on the move, perhaps missing documentation, and so on. All of this comes out here. It's recorded in the conversations with key um, characteristics or key definitory traits of the crisis sort of locked in at this stage of the analysis. Then we do have the path itself, uh, if it's being utilized in the country, coming out in the sectoral analysis, right? Sorry, so Alex, the, can you just say what the path is? I'm a little lost on that Protection analysis framework. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I thought it was already mentioned, uh, but my bad, I should have uh, I just didn't out. know the acronym, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the protection analysis framework is what the colleagues were asking about. Um, is essentially the way the protection cluster is doing their protection analysis. So it's a cluster-specific um, tool or, or approach or method, if you will. 
And that will be utilized in this module number two when the sector is being requested to do their uh, own analysis and determine pin and severity. Um, that is not uh, necessarily an area where uh, GF would, would um, kind of look into. It would just take the results of the production analysis framework being applied and generating certain findings. And then there is a third element in the intersectoral um, uh, part in the, in the third module one of the indicators is uh, one of the indicators or one of the, the, the conditions, outcomes that are being measured um, is grave violations um, of human rights or uh, international humanitarian law. And for that, we worked very closely with the protection cluster colleagues and OACHR and others to come up with some, um, some, some clear uh, way of, of measuring on a scale from one to five um, the severity of the situation, depending on whether the violations are widespread or systematic and the type of violations, right? So that is also embedded into this, um, in GF 2.0 in the third module. So essentially the protection pieces are coming out in all of the three elements, all of the three modules of GF 2.0. Um, so there are linkages uh, made. Um, I hope, uh, I don't know if this is a satisfactory answer to the protection experts in our in our group, uh, but we, we definitely considered it and incorporated it in GF 2.0. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, maybe just a couple of last questions, because I know we're coming up towards the end and I want to make sure we just do a quick summary of things. Someone was asking, am I correct in understanding that the threshold for being a person in need will now be the same throughout the world, given the kind of way that the GIF has been structured? And I guess linked to that also, by interoperability is the intent to normalize how severity ratings between different scales align against each other. Yes, so I'll um, I'll try to answer this one, but then uh, I would ask uh, Herbert and Christina to compliment me as well. Um, so there's uh, the interoperability is uh, a little bit different for the people in need uh, than it is for the severity. For the severity is very straightforward um, because there is a general description of what now every cluster agrees is severity five, four, three, two, and one. So severity five is sectoral collapse. And everyone across the board, at least at global level, all of the clusters have agreed that this is what they mean with severity five, which means that then when we receive the inputs from the clusters in an analysis process, and we receive a five and a five and a five and a five as a severity for an unit of analysis for an area, we know that this is sectoral collapse. So it's sectoral collapse in education, it's a sectoral collapse in food, and it's a sectoral collapse in wash, and it's a sectoral collapse in health, for example. So that is now means that we can bring together those results um, in a coherent manner and confidently say as a system, as a result, as an analytical output that, okay, here we have sectoral collapse across the board. Now, what exactly and how sectoral collapse is defined depends on from cluster to cluster. It could be a break in the food chains. It could be uh, widespread um, livelihood areas um, affected um, or compromised. It could be all the schools shutting down. It could be all the schools are being demolished by an earthquake. Well, there's, I'll just give you a few examples, but there's different ways in which a sectoral collapse can be measured, right? Or it could be that the infrastructure is there and people simply cannot access it because they're besieged or, or conflict is ongoing. So again, a sectoral collapse, nobody can access the basic services. But what we know is that it's a sectoral collapse. So at, at, at the intersectoral level, those results can now be brought together. And we confidently say that this, when we say it's a five, we know exactly what we mean. For the PIN, uh, the people in need uh, estimates, that is a little bit different. Um, there was, there were extensive conversations in the methodology working group on what exactly people in need uh, refers to and how it can be operationalized. We have a definition that is set by the Interagency Standing Committee, the IAC. And that definition, everyone is using that definition. However, in our conversations with the global clusters, uh, we realize that there are certain um, deviations or certain exceptions or certain uh, interpretations of that particular definition. So we put together all of the inputs from the clusters and we tried to understand what was common across all of them. 
And we realized that there were five uh, parameters or five things that come up in almost every kind of, let's say, interpretation or explanation of the people in need. And that was, does it include population affected by a particular shock or does it go beyond that concept of people affected by the particular shock as per the boundaries of the um, HNO, right? The scope and scale. That was one. And uh, I didn't get into the details of this one, but that's one parameter. The second parameter is, does it include assistance or not? The third parameter was um, whether it includes projections or forecasting, or it's just the real situation on the ground as 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 it is found based on the assessments. So all of these, uh, we have five parameters, and now we're requesting during the analysis process uh, for everyone to evaluate to what extent they align to those five parameters, to that global uh, reference that all the global clusters have agreed on, to what extent what's happening in the country when it comes to the people in need estimation aligns uh, cluster by cluster. So with the sectoral severity, we're very confident and very comfortable that the results will be brought together and everyone is speaking the same language. With the people in need, we hope to get there, but for now, what we are doing is to be more transparent. It's not fully standardized and that's work in progress, but we are at least ensuring transparency to know exactly if there is a deviation from that common understanding, from that operational guidance, global operational guidance for the overall PIN definition, or if there is no deviation. So that's what uh, that's a little bit the difference between the severity and the PIN, uh, but both are aiming for interoperability. So Super. I don't know, Herbert, Christina, if you want to add, if we have the time. Or Nick. Or Nick, yeah. Okay. Super. Anybody else on that one? Otherwise, I'm going to wrap us up because we're at time, if that's okay. Um, thank you so much to all our panelists. I think it's been a great introduction to understanding where we have come from, from the commitment in the grand bargain to JIF, the original, the evaluation and review of it that was done, and now this new and improved JIF 2.0, which is ready to go for the humanitarian program cycle 2024. So it really is an opportunity to bring together all the different assessments that are out there via clusters or sectors so that they can be brought together and through a joint and intersector and not intersectoral analysis, really come to some broader understandings of the people in need numbers, but also in terms of the sectoral and intersectoral needs. And I'm sure it won't be 100% uh, without any challenges, like anything new that's being rolled out. But I think with the trainings that are taking place, that it gives us an opportunity to really see more transparently, as you said, that what the people in need numbers are and also sort of what the overall needs are. There were many, many more questions still there. We couldn't get through them all, which shows the great interest that there is around the JIF 2.0. Um, I, I know that uh, Christina, Nick and Her Alex, Christina and Herbert, you had come in on the questions. Nick, you I didn't give you a chance to, or you didn't put your hand up, so I didn't. I don't know, Nick, if you had any last words before I wrap up, just because everybody else got to answer some questions. No, I won't go back and, and revisit things other than to say this is a super exciting opportunity for us. And we're really looking forward to working with all the people in the humanitarian, uh, all humanitarian stakeholders in rolling out these common standards. And thank you all for taking the time to be on this call. Thanks very much, Nick. And with that, I mean, as was said before, please do look at the website, sign up for more information. The rollout will be happening from June, July, August in English, French, and Spanish. The training of trainers will be taking place so that it can be done, hopefully, in other countries and other languages. But the Arabic translation will be hopefully forthcoming. There was always also a request for Portuguese. So I think as we're moving ahead, there will be more questions and, and requests for things in different languages so that people can participate in the JIF so that we can arrive at much more of a joint and intersectoral analysis using the tools that are out there. And so for those who are doing the analysis, doing the kind of needs assessments already, that is the area where you really need to bring in that people-centered approach so that when it gets to that JIF position, you're able to make that analysis um, and clarify what the needs are for decision makers based on 
assessments that have been done with a people-centered approach in mind. So huge thanks again to Nick, Herbert, Christina, Alex for your helpful presentations and for walking us through the new GIF 2.0. Also thanks to everyone in the audience for your great participation, your great questions. Um, Alex, Christina, Herbert, Nick, please feel free to continue to respond to some of those questions so we can put them up on the website. We do have a short evaluation. If you could please fill that out, that would be very helpful. My colleague Vaughn is putting that into the chat and the recording of the event along with the presentations and the answers to the questions will be put up on that webpage in the coming days. Huge thanks also to PHAP colleagues in the background, and it's been a real pleasure having you all. Apologies for going over a little bit, but there's obviously a lot of interest Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. Thank you.